Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Mendefiz, and um, thank you all very much for this high level of interest in, in our discussion. Uh, believe me, I, I want to learn as much from you today as, as you might learn from me. I'm looking forward to your questions. Um, I think we can do this in English, right? Everybody's on board? Great. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very conscious that I uh, am one in a series of, of speakers who uh, have the opportunity to appear before you, other ambassadors here, uh, Jamie McGoldrick, and uh, I think the British ambassador is coming. And, um, so I, I very much appreciate the chance to uh, share with you uh, the U.S. perspective on various issues. Um, I want to congratulate you on uh, on your being students at this uh, excellent university. Uh, I had a chance to tour a little bit to see the investment that's been made in infrastructure and facilities. Um, this is a world-class institution, and you obviously have world-class students. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very impressed. I congratulate you on, on your uh, accomplishments. And, uh, you know, it's very clear to me that when I'm in an audience like this, I, I, I very much enjoy uh, the chance to speak with students because I, I feel I'm addressing the future <coughs> leadership of Georgia. And uh, the faculty has a big responsibility here to prepare you uh, and you have a big responsibility to uh, prepare yourselves for future leadership roles in the private sector, in the government, and in the uh, non-governmental sector. So, um, I think the idea was I would speak a few minutes about the U.S. elections and their impact on U.S.-Georgia relations, and then uh, we'll open the floor up to questions. And believe me, I, I won't speak very long because uh, I, I think we're, we're all more interested in, in, in your questions. Um, let me say a couple of things about the, the U.S. elections in, in uh, November. Um, and in a sense, one thing that's similar between the U.S. election and the election in Georgia is that the, uh, the results were a little bit of a surprise to everybody. You know, uh, in, in the United States, there was a perception that the election was going to be very close. That Obama and Romney were, as we say, running neck and neck. Uh, and the polls seemed to suggest this too just as the polls in Georgia suggested that the, the result was, was likely to be clear. Um, but in the end, uh, in the United States, the, uh, the result was a surprise in the sense that uh, President Obama won pretty, pretty handily, as we say. He, he won a pretty decisive victory, both in the Electoral College, in which uh, each, you know, the, the way our electoral system uh, is devised under the Constitution, uh, it's done on a state-by-state -state basis, and the, the winner has to win a majority of the states, of the, of the electors from each state, but also the popular vote. He won a, a decisive uh, majority, at least a couple of million in, in the popular vote. Um, and, you 
know, it's interesting to look at the role of polls in these situations because uh, pollsters uh, get paid a lot of money to make predictions, and sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. But I have the feeling that both in the United States and in Georgia, uh, voters don't like to have their opinions taken for granted. The whole idea of a vote is you get to to uh, express yourself, uh, what you really believe and what you want, and you don't like people telling you in advance what you're going to do or what the outcome's going to be. I think at least in the United States, uh, that was part of the phenomenon uh, at work. And, uh, and President Obama uh, did win a second term. Uh, I can tell you when he won his first term uh, four years ago, I was ambassador in Uzbekistan, in Tashkent. And just as we did here, we had a, a, an event early in the morning to watch the election returns come in. We organized an event at a hotel. And uh, the atmosphere was electric four years ago. As uh, uh, people from, from uh, both in the American community, the community in Uzbekistan, uh, which, by the way, is not a particularly democratic uh, country, as you know, uh, watched this process unfold and watched for the first time as Americans elected uh, an African American to the presidency. And it was a very powerful moment in American history. Uh, this time around, there was maybe a little bit less drama associated with it. Uh, but it was still a very important event in the sense of having President Obama re-elected now to uh, see what he can accomplish in a second term as president when you're not bound by all of the, the politics that uh, apply when you're still in your first term in office and you're running for re-election. Um, another thing I would say about our elections to remember, it's very important, it wasn't just an election for president. You also had elections to, the, to a third of the Senate to uh, all of the members of the House of Representatives, to many governors of the states, and to many uh, local uh, offices like mayors and city councils. And I just emphasize that because it's important to remember that um, in a country as big as the United States, uh, one man can't run everything. And it's not all about uh, the president. Um, it is about uh, the, the sharing of power uh, with Congress and at the state level uh, where, where, as much as possible, uh, issues are devolved down to the appropriate level so that they're manageable, because otherwise you have gridlock if every issue has to go to the president. So uh, the results of the um, election at the non-presidential level were also important. Uh, uh, the Senate stayed in the hands of the Democrats. The House stayed in the hands of the Republicans. Um, and, and what does that mean? Well, that gets to, to another issue which I should talk about in terms of our election. Um, as you know, we've had a, a, a serious ideological uh, divide in America between uh, the Democrats and the Republicans, with the Republicans becoming increasingly conservative, increasingly uh, focused on fiscal conservatism, uh, balancing the budget, cutting government expenditures, and so forth. Um, this, this divide has almost become gridlock. And many people were looking at this election to send a signal that um, the time for gridlock was over, that uh, it was time for people to approach difficult issues with an open mind in a spirit of compromise. And um, I think although the results were not completely decisive in this respect, I think they were important. I think the message that came from them to both the president and to the Republicans was the American people uh, do not want to have a, an economic crisis, a, a, a fiscal crisis, because of ideology. It's important to find a, a compromise. And of course, in the nature of politics, compromises uh, can be very difficult to arrive at. Uh, you, you need what we call a forcing event, something that forces everybody to make a compromise. Well, the forcing event on these fiscal issues is that on January 3rd, if the two sides do not agree, then massive uh, cuts will automatically take place in the U.S. budget. It will affect every aspect of the U.S. government. And many people believe could create a, a business confidence crisis uh, of global economic proportions. So uh, there's a great deal of focus now on Washington on resolving this fiscal uh, crisis. Um, you'll hear reference to the, the fiscal cliff going over the edge on January 3rd if they don't reach a compromise. And uh, I would just say that, that 
to many people, the message from the election was that uh, responsible politicians need to find a compromise on this before it's too late. Um, and then finally, let me just uh, say a word about U.S.-Georgia relations and, and what the election had to, to say about all this, because uh, I think everybody in this room uh, really would understand that um, U.S.-Georgia relations uh, were not going to really change that much, whether Obama won or Romney won. U.S.-Georgia relations are founded on uh, a, a strong track record of cooperation over the last 20 years uh, based on the notion that Georgia uh, wants to define its own place in the world, define its own security arrangements, define its own political system, not dominated by any outside power. And, and that is what we want for Georgia, too. And that's what we've been trying to support for the last 20 years. And that support comes from Democrats and Republicans alike. And then particularly after the war in 2008, uh, the United States, uh, on a bipartisan basis, came forward with a $1 billion assistance package, which we're still spending down. And that just reflects the strong bipartisan feeling in the United States about U.S.-Georgia relations. So uh, in a sense, there's not a big story to discuss there. And, uh, what I'd like to do really is now just to uh, leave it at that, uh, because I think it's your questions and, and hopefully my answers that will be of, of most use to you uh, today. So thank you very much. situation in the Middle East, that's a big question, uh, because there, there are many different aspects to it. Uh, traditionally, people think of the Arab-Israeli dispute, but you also have to look at what's going on in Egypt and uh, in the broader Muslim world uh, with the so-called Arab Spring, um, and you have to look at what's going on uh, more immediately in your neighborhood with Iran. And so uh, there, there are many different aspects to this. Uh, you know, I, I think that, um, again, we see Georgia as a strong partner in, in the international community in expressing interest uh, for a, a, a fair peace in the Middle East between the Arabs and the Israelis, uh, a two-state solution. Uh, we see uh, a shared interest in having uh, the Muslim world uh, decide for itself how to interpret Islam. Is it going to be the more radical interpretation of some? Is it going to be the more uh, you know, moderate interpretation of others? This is not something that we ultimately can decide, but we all have an interest in encouraging the Muslim world to uh, find a, a solution in a peaceful way. And then with Iran, uh, we all have an interest in making sure that Iran lives up to its obligations uh, under the International Atomic Energy Agency to uh, you know, move, manage its nuclear program in a way that is consistent with international uh, regimes. And uh, right now, it is our conclusion that Iran, and not just ours, but the IAEA's view that Iran is not in compliance. Therefore, there is a, uh, a strategy of sanctions and trying to gradually pressure Iran peacefully to abide by its international obligations of, you know, I mean, I, I can tell you, uh, I've been in the Foreign Service now for 32 years, and uh, for not a single day of that period has the United States had diplomatic relations with Iran. And that's a tragedy. Uh, you, you know, it's very important to understand a country uh, by having people on the ground there. So a lot of what's going on, I think, is a failure to communicate. Uh, but the fact is, the Iranian government uh, has engaged in atrocious uh, abuses of human rights towards its own people. Uh, it is in violation of uh, international standards on managing its nuclear program. And uh, we all hope that we can find a diplomatic solution to this so that 
uh, you don't have an outbreak of, of violence in a region that's already very sensitive. I hope that answers your question. Next question, please. Mr. Ambassador, you mentioned uh, the situation in the Middle East, the case to Israel and Palestine. It would be interesting to hear why the United States is against the Palestinian state and why actually, in your opinion, the case to Israel, why do you just support? Sorry, the second part of your question? Why do you just support the Palestinian uh -huh. state? Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I, I will let Georgia speak for itself on, on its vote, um, uh, but, you know, I mean, obviously, Georgia was not alone in taking the position it took, and every country has to do what it considers to be in its own interest. Um, you know, for the United States, uh, our view is there must be a two-state solution to the Palestinian uh, problem, uh, and that unilateral steps to try to uh, declare a certain state of affairs that is not grounded in reality are only going to make things worse. Um, you know, there, there is uh, nobody is trying to put the blame just on one side. This situation. It's quite clear that both sides have responsibilities uh, uh, to uh, uh, pursue if there's going to be a solution. Um, but our feeling was that this particular measure in the United Nations was going to make things worse. It's not that, I mean, in fact, our goal is ultimately to have a Palestinian state. But if, if Palestinians go ahead and declare this unilaterally and it uh, just causes the Israelis to come back on them harder, then you really haven't accomplished anything. So um, our goal is the same, but uh, we and our partners in Europe and elsewhere have uh, sometimes different views on how to get to that goal. There was a question back yeah, here. Yeah, please. Okay. So nice to meet you once again, International Black University, the Faculty of American Studies. So, uh, you have just mentioned the elections and mentioned the, the fact that the Georgia and the United States are founded on the principles of democracy and so on and so on. It's, it's nice to hear from you, but as, as, as an uh, expertise in this field, what do you mean? Uh, we saw the articles uh, in Wall Street Journal, in Figaro, and in many other newspapers that expressed their dissatisfaction towards the policy of the new governments. And how, what do you think? Uh, how can the approach like this prevent us from affiliating with the NATO or the European Union? What's your personal opinion? Thank you. Sorry, how can those articles, what effect will those articles have on... Yes, the, the articles in famous newspaper yeah, press, right. in Wall Street journals, if I'm not mistaken, and in Figaro, and they expressed their dissatisfaction towards the arrest environment when we know right. that and there is... Your question is, will those articles affect... Yes, yes, affect the, our policy to affiliate in NATO yeah. or in the European Union? Right. Well, first of all, uh, on the articles, um, you know, the, um, the America, the West, well, I can only speak about the, the American press. Um, I, I won't speak for Figaro, but, um, you know, American newspapers uh, pride themselves on uh, being independent and objective, and they're not always objective and independent. Sometimes they are one-sided, but um, I think it would be a mistake to think that you can buy press um, in, in prominent American publications like the, like the Wall Street Journal or, or the uh, Washington Post. Um, I think that sometimes uh, journalists from those organizations uh, and, and the people they talk to are susceptible to a kind of a pack mentality, that is to say, they don't want to be too different from everybody else because that might mean they're wrong. And there is a conventional wisdom in the United States about Georgia and about the, the, the government that was in place before. And it's taking a while for people to adjust to the new reality. Uh, now, uh, it's also the case that uh, in you know elements of the political system in Georgia are trying to influence those perceptions. And some elements are better than others in their ability to influence perceptions. Um, you know, I would just say, again, it's very important to remember that uh, when, when whatever the Washington Post says, that's based on things the Washington Post decided it would say, not things the U.S. government decided it would say or, or anything like that. So these are, uh, these are uh, free media who 
who, who not only can say what they want, but then have to take responsibility for what they say. So if it turns out that what they said is, is wrong, then that's going to embarrass them. So they, you know, the, in my view, they're, they're, as we say, there's another shoe to drop. The jury is not out on, on this whole set of issues. I, I would say that you know, the, the general picture now where uh, you, know, you do have a, a focus in the media on these arrests, uh, you do have accusations from the previous government that, uh, that uh, the new government is, is moving towards dictatorship and things like this. This is incredibly damaging to Georgia's image around the world. It is uh, not the image that Georgia wants to have projected. Uh, and I'm not saying one side or the other is responsible. It's actually my view that it takes two to tango. Um, but uh, it is extremely important that uh, Georgia's leadership finds a way to defuse this situation. Uh, and my, my belief is that uh, because both leaders are patriots, they will find a way to do that. I'm confident that they will. Questions? Well, you know, first of all, I would say it's not uh, in 
entirely a bleak picture. There, there has been progress over the last couple of months in certain areas. Um, the uh, president obviously uh, confirmed the cabinet appointments of the new government without any question, and a number of the ministers are very capable people. Uh, just last week, uh, we had a meeting of the U.S.-Georgia under the strategic partnership charter of our security working group, and uh, the two, but both the, the government and the opposition were represented there and worked with the American side to prepare the way for uh, discussions uh, in, uh, at NATO in December at the ministerial level, uh, where it's extremely important to have a un united Georgian position going into something like that. Um, uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll have meetings in Washington under the, the partnership charter on economic and on people-to-people -people issues. And there again, we're confident that the two sides will, will find ways to put forward a Georgian position that is in Georgia's interest and that's a, a unified position. Um, I, I believe another example will be, I think there will be agreement soon on a new chief of defense uh, to, to replace the, old, the outgoing one. Um, so, I, you know, the, the issue isn't what kind of model can Georgia copy. It's not, you know, can you have a French cohabitation model and make it work, or should you study how Argentina or somebody else, Georgia needs to find its own model here. Um, the fact is you have a constitution that was written by the previous government that still applies, but that in some ways doesn't fit the situation. So, you know, uh, the issue is are, are the sides willing to come together and meet and compromise and find a way forward. Uh, I, I'm convinced based on my discussions with people on both sides that it is possible to do that. Um, but it's the same thing as you have in the United States. Uh, at the end of the day, it requires the political leadership at the very top to say that they're uh, they're going to uh, they're determined to find a way and they're going to compromise. Uh, you know, uh, one one person, a, a politician I spoke with, compared it. You know, he said the the government has a machine gun and the opposition has a knife, and they they each need to just lay down their weapons and find a way uh, out of this. So, you know, the the uh, the, the way uh, arrests have been handled, we, we have been very clear that uh, uh, it goes without saying that a government is responsible for enforcing justice and the rule of law. But it's important to do so transparently, uh, to investigate, to have uh, due process, to have bail. And, uh, you know, I think that as uh, if those kinds of things are applied, then, then uh, people will understand that, that justice is moving forward. But, uh, at the end of the day, also, people have to understand how this affects Georgia's image. Um, you know, no country looks good when you have headlines saying, you know, arrests. It just, it's hard to understand. It makes people wonder what's going on. Uh, my name is George Mokinhansa. Uh, here's the thing with the U.S. State University. Uh, I think that the question is about cooperation. I have a question about the U.S. visa because it is very tough to get U.S. visa here in Georgia consulate. Uh, I give my example, for example, I was uh, refused four times uh, if you want to be the type of visa and finally got in Brussels, Belgium. Belgium. Uh, so uh, I think, uh, and other people uh, also uh, want to participate uh, some exchange programs or uh, to get training in the medical, medical doctor, to get training uh, in the residence from the United States are uh, having the same obstacles and uh, same problems. Uh, what's your view uh, about the future of uh, maybe somehow maybe uh, it easier to get the uh, services in your Right. Thank you very much. Well, that's a really important question, and I, I'm sorry for anybody who. Uh, wanted to come to the United States and couldn't get a visa. Um, there, there are two things that work against you uh, on the visa front. One is um, America is a nation of immigrants, and there's this funny human dynamic that once people immigrate to the U.S., then they want to keep everybody else out. <laughs> and, um, and so the way our law is written, anybody who applies for a visa, the vice consul must assume that you are trying to immigrate by law. They are required to assume you. The burden is on you to prove that you're coming to the U.S. only to visit and then return home. And so it means, and I'm not saying that's fair. I personally think it's strange, but it's old-fashioned. It goes back to an earlier era in American history, but that is still the law. And um, 
So what it means is that if you want a visa, you, you know, to visit or study, you need to show that you have strong ties back to Georgia, your family, you own a house, bank account, uh, you've got a job for when you get back. Uh, any the family, uh, you know, your own children or wife or whatever, um, it's, uh, it's just important to be able to demonstrate that, that you do intend to come home. The other dynamic is uh, uh, September 11, 2001. Uh, and then you went from a situation where vice consuls were under, you know, a certain amount of interest and pressure to try to give people visas, if, assuming they could show that they were going to go home, because um, you wanted to attract business, you wanted to attract students. And then it turned out one of the students who got a visa went to uh, air aviation school and learned how to fly a plane into the towers. And so the vice consul who issued that visa will have to remember every day for the rest of his life that he made a mistake. And um, therefore, it's not fair to anybody, who, you know, you can blame bin Laden. Uh, partly that's one of the reasons why it's, it's always it's going to be tough for a while longer to, to get that visa. Not because anybody thinks you're a terrorist, but just because the level of scrutiny has gotten so much higher. But I will say that, you know, this process is a matter of, as all of you will know once you you get into public policy, it's always a matter of balancing, calibrating. There's no perfect solution. We understand now that the way uh, we've enforced the visa laws in the last 10 years have, have kept away from America many business people, many students, people who we need. It's hurting our economy. So you will actually see Secretary Clinton and others talk now about the importance of, you know, calibrating the system in a way now that makes it uh, easier for people to uh, get visas, but without putting the U.S. at, at risk. So, um, you know, try again. <laughs> I'm just sorry it costs, what is it, $170? You, you went to Belgium. Well, that's a good place, too. Good. Thank you, though, for your question. I appreciate it. Yes. Okay. Can you please tell all the students what it was like being a student, so they kind of have an idea how it was like being a student in Georgia and being a student in the United States. Huh. When I graduated also from the United States, sometimes it might be a little bit hard to kind of, uh, for example, to tell the first year of student, first year of uh, year student, like how is it like being a student really? And it's a huge difference time. So what was your experience? Wow. I mean, obviously, everybody here is doing very well to be where they are, and you all have extremely bright futures, so far be it from me to give you uh, career advice. Um, but I, I, I mean, being a student at university in the U.S., um, you know, it just, there's, it just depends on the student. You know, some people go to, to college to party. You know, it's, in the U.S., uh, we don't have conscription anymore. We don't have military conscription. Uh, and so, uh, in, in many parts of the world, conscription is the first place where students leave home and they mix with, with other young people and they learn about places outside their hometown and they, they sort of develop a broader view of the world. For, for most Americans, college is the first time they go away from home and for, for the first part of the experience is just about learning what it's like to meet people from other places, uh, to be off on your own without your parents supervising everything. And uh, some students decide they, they want to party, and they just want to have a good time, and they don't take their studies very seriously. Um, I would say most students understand you have to, again, you have to strike that balance. Uh, sure, you want to uh, enjoy yourself a little bit, but um, it's important to study. You're being, your parents are paying, or you're paying uh, tuition to go to a place you're expected to, to work. Um, maybe not, again, it's about striking a balance. I'll tell you, I, I was never, I worked hard in college, but. I was not necessarily the smartest or the hardest working student in the class. Um, and I think it's important for you to find the balance that works for you. Uh, but the other thing is, uh, some people go to college thinking, uh, I'm going to take what I'm supposed to take. 
You know, I remember I studied economics in college because in the 1970s, you know, when you graduated, you knew it was going to be hard to find a job. And so if you had economics on your resume, that would make you more attractive to business. But I hated economics, and I was no good at it. So um, the lesson is, I think, study what you're interested in. Because if you're interested in something, you're more likely to be good at it. And if you're good at it, people will notice, and they'll apply that, uh, that confidence that you have to other spheres of life. And they'll know that you, you may be good at archaeology, but maybe that means you'd be good to hire for, for British Petroleum, because they need archaeologists when they're digging their, their uh, pipelines or whatever. So I think it's important, and the students who I think succeed most in the American university system who take a couple of years to experiment, look at different options, different courses. Try things that might seem totally new and unfamiliar to you, because you might find, actually, it's very interesting. And then, at a certain point, make a decision on what you want to, to, to focus on. Um, you don't want to specialize too early, but you want to move in a certain direction. If you find that that's the wrong direction, if you're still young, it's not too late to change, do something different. But at a certain point, you want to focus on something. I think there's some people in the States who have been psychology majors for 12 years. You know, That tells you that, that they didn't find the right fit. Um, there are decisions to be made about whether to go from bachelor, from, from undergraduate to graduate school. I, when I graduated from college, I said, thank you very much. I don't ever want to pick up another book. Um, I took the Foreign Service exam. Uh, to, to get into the Foreign Service, you just take an exam and you uh, first a written one, and then an oral exam, a series of interviews, and I didn't pass it the first time. So I went to work in the Iowa legislature as a staffer, and then I, I took it a second time and I passed it. And uh, to your question about you know how a diplomatic, how our diplomatic service works, you you do a variety of jobs. You go from third secretary to second secretary to first secretary. Again, I think that. Um, those who tell you you have to follow a certain career path to be successful, I don't necessarily believe that. I think if you do what sounds interesting to you, if you have an open mind uh, and, and you enjoy it, then you'll do relatively well, and I guess I did. And, uh, and uh, I was asked to be ambassador to Uzbekistan a few years ago, and, um, and I'm, I'm, now I'm here in Georgia, and I'm, I'm very happy and very grateful to be here. But, you know, the, the short answer is there's no single a recipe for success, you just have to kind of listen as a student, listen to your heart, listen to yourself, and figure out what, what's really interesting for you, and, uh, and keep your mind open to various possibilities, and talk to your teachers, they're, they're smart people, and they can give you good advice. Those elections would be a litmus test, and I think uh, 
most people I talk to say Georgia passed that test, then it, there's a transition. And, and that's inevitable, too, uh, particularly with the constitutional arrangements that you have here. This is a further test, a further uh, uh, challenge for Georgia's democracy. But again, I, I think with leaders who are patriots, uh, you will find a way forward. Uh, I don't believe it's too late. I think it's, it's important. Uh, it's, you know, my role is to remind uh, people here that uh, what this looks like from outside the country. And so uh, what we've heard, some of the actions, some of the, the, the rhetoric and the criticism has, has affected Georgia's uh, in, image in the world, but it's not irreparable. And uh, it, can, it can be fixed, I think, uh, fairly straightforwardly. <laughs> about interpreting Georgia's constitution, and uh, even Georgian experts can't agree on them. You know, there are two contradictory elements in the constitution, and so it's not for an outsider to come in and say, this is the, the right answer, uh, here's what you should do. This is something that has to be part of the political negotiation, yes, part of the compromise. Yeah. I mean, I honestly, as I understand it, there are two directly contradictory uh, chapter, you know, uh, articles in the Constitution. I, I can't tell you the answer. And it really, it, it wouldn't help you for me to tell you, because you can't force one side to accept it. Both sides have to agree that they're going to find a way to make this work. And you know what, you talk to responsible politicians on each side, and, and they absolutely can find a way. There's no doubt in my mind they can make this work. Because either way, you're only talking about until October before it's going to change anyway to a new Constitution. So you're talking about how to manage this period of the next 10 months, and uh, there's no reason that can't be accomplished. Do you have a some of his campaign speeches. Uh, at one point, Romney made some you know, comment about Russia as the number one enemy of the United States, which a number of people found to be a very strange comment. Uh, but uh, I think that um, you know, the United States, whether it's the Republicans or the Democrats, recognizes the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Georgia. The fact that, uh, uh, again, it goes back to the question about unilateral actions. Uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, uh, at the behest of Russia, unilaterally, unilaterally declared independence uh, and, and by force were broken away uh, nominally from Georgian territory. And this is um, in violation of international law. The United States supports Georgia's position of restoring uh, full territorial control over your uh, sovereign territory. And I, I don't think, whether it was Obama or Romney, that that's going to make a difference. now. Managing the relationship with Russia is also a matter of being uh, realistic. And you know, the new government has talked about wanting a more normal relationship with Russia. We, we absolutely think that makes sense. Uh, I don't think any Georgian politician can make uh, trade-offs that sacrifice Abkhazia and South Ossetia, so I don't think that's the issue. Um, I think everybody needs to remember that under the uh, rules of the World Trade Organization, which Russia joined, uh, Directly thanks to Georgia, Georgia supported that effort. Uh, Georgia, Russia is obliged, it's not a gift, it's required to accept Georgian uh, goods, wine and, and mineral water, and whatever. So um, I think you'll see in the next year an effort to remind Russia of its obligations um, and then to uh, encourage, you know, I, I think uh, Georgians have, a, have the right attitude. Uh, they know that 
uh, this issue isn't going to be resolved overnight, that uh, you have to stand by your principles, be patient, and ultimately I think the, the Russians will realize that the, you know, trying to force a change here is not going to work. Maybe one more question. As you said, you were an ambassador in Uzbekistan, and can you tell us what are the main differences or similarities between our countries, and what challenges our countries have? Wow. <laughs> um, well, the, the, the similarity you have is that you were both under the, the, the control of the Soviets for 70 years, and that affected uh, institutions, it affected uh, mentality, it affected the idea that uh, how people of you freedom, you know, if, you, if you're worried that your phone conversations are, are being listened to, uh, you know, that you can't uh, speak completely freely. I mean, both countries went through that experience. Uh, I think Georgia came out of that experience with a, with a blast, uh, whereas Uzbekistan is still somewhere lingering in that experience. And partly that's a function of, uh, of political culture and, and geography. I think Georgia has a, a, a vibrant political culture. You, you're more independent-minded, uh, you feel more secure in a way in the region, and you want to establish those links to the West and, and uh, move forward as, as your own country. And I think uh, you know, we felt in the last uh, many years a, a feeling of much greater, faster liberalization. Uh, in my mind, if you looked at the former Soviet Union, you know, the Baltics were maybe the, the, the most uh, Western, most democratic, and they had a tradition of democracy before uh, the Soviet period. Then you had Georgia, and then you have everybody else. Um, uh, you know, Uzbekistan, you have to look at their, where they are. Uh, they have neighbors like Afghanistan, like Kyrgyzstan. Uh, you know, one of the interesting relationships is between the Rose Revolution and the situation in, in Uzbekistan. The, the Uzbeks would tell me, you see what happens when you have a revolution the leadership gets thrown out. You know, you your aid programs and your democracy programs, they're just trying to get rid of me, Karimo, you know. And of course we'd say that's that's not true. We're trying to help your country who if you want to be more democratic and stay president, that's fine with us. But he didn't believe it. And uh, and he looked at uh, and even many Uzbek people looked at the situation in Afghanistan and Kyrgyzstan and they said, you know, um, we we don't like being in a of such a rigidly controlled society, but we'd rather be like this than be like the Afghans or the Kyrgyz, where there's civil war and turmoil. So, um, you know, I always thought one of the ironies that the first election that, uh, the, when I was there in 2007, when we first arrived, there was an election and President Karimov was elected by, you know, 89.1% or something. And I always thought it was ironic that the government needed to calculate that and, and because I think if they had a free and fair election, Karimov still would have won, but maybe by 51% or 55% or something. So um, it's ironic that they felt the need to have such control, but I think that the political culture of that region is very focused on control. It's partly, um, you know, part of the world they woke up for centuries and they never knew it was Genghis Khan going to be on the horizon, you know, Tamerlane. Uh, they, they will trade individual liberty for security to, to a degree. Um, and uh, uh, also, in, in societies where uh, water is scarce, uh, it's been shown that uh, people are willing to trade individual liberty for a strong leader who can control water resources in a way that enables people to survive. And so, uh, and Central Asia is a very dry region, as you know. So, there, there are political cultural factors at stake, um, but there have been different experiences between Georgia and, and Uzbekistan, obviously. And the, the, the main point is, I think, that Georgia is, is a unique uh, model in the region for uh, democracy in action. And, um, you know, we're all, the whole world is watching to see that this uh, experiment succeeds. And, uh, again, we're confident that with uh, uh, patriotic leaders and with interested uh, people in civil society that it will work. So I want to thank you very, very much for your attention and your good questions. Good